Moving on to today is multi-component distillation sequencing. So when you were doing multi-component distillation and looking at the shortcut method, you were looking at more than one component okay, in your distillation column. So what if you've got your mixture of, say, five or six components together, but you need each of those components by themselves? Yeah? That means that in one of our distillation column, we might be able to look at the separation of one of those components out of the mixture. But to get all of those components as pure components, we're going to need more distillation columns. So how do we go about looking at the order of those distillation columns? Okay? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So we'll start by just looking at what, what I mean by this sequencing problem. And then we'll look into design heuristics, so some of the key rules and thoughts that we want to do to look at these columns. Then we'll think about what are some of our key performance indicators for our distillation columns. So, for instance, how do we, when we look at these sequences, how do we know which one is the best? Yep. And then we're going to move on to what's called complex distillation columns. Okay? So this is sort of an extension to the type of distillation columns you're used to seeing. But these have the ability to save us extra energy for our separation. And then we'll see the heuristics for how we can actually incorporate those complex distillation columns into our distillation column sequencing. So then you'll have a full sort of armory of potential techniques to use to, to look at all these different distillation separations. So let's go back to what you're really currently familiar with. So this is a simple distillation column. Okay, So I'm just covering this because a simple distillation column, although that's what we've been used to, is actually a strict, there's actually a strict definition of what a simple distillation column actually has okay? and what a simple distillation column is. And it's a distillation column that has a single feed. It has two products, so our top and our bottom product. The key components, so the components we're actually doing the separation on, are adjacent to each other in volatility. So in this case, we've got five components coming down here, and they're in order of their volatility. So A is the most volatile, so has the lowest boiling point, and E is the least volatile, so has the highest boiling point. Okay? And the key components are adjacent in volatility, so in this case, it's B and C, which are next to each other in our list, our key components. And then also, the last definition of a simple distillation column is it has one reboiler and one condenser. Okay? So basically, the type of distillation columns that you've been using so far. Okay? <coughs> Now, let's start with a simple case. So I said if we've got multiple components, we've got to think about how we can sequence our distillation columns. So in a very simple case, let's say we've just got a mixture of A, B, and C. Okay? So and what we need is we need pure A, pure B, and pure C. So straight away with our simple distillation column, we know we've only got two products. Yep. So we can't use one distillation column to get three pure products. So we potentially, we could do this. So we could have a dis first distillation column that produces pure A and a mixture of B and C, and then a second distillation column that separates our B and our C. Okay? 
And this happens to be something called the direct sequence. And that means that we're always separating our lightest or our lowest volatility component off in each of our separations. But most of you probably will have spotted already that why, why is this the option? Yeah? So there's a, different, there's a different order we can do the separation in. Why can't we separate C off and leave a mixture of A and B? Yeah? And then separate A and B from each other. Okay? So now how would you decide which of these is better? Yeah? One of these will cost us less money to run. Okay? And the whole purpose of today is to try and work out how we can select the one that's cheapest. So in this case, this one here where we're actually taking off the heaviest components one by one happens to be called the indirect sequence. Okay? So if we've only got three components, it's pretty simple because we've only got these two options. Yeah? So I think if we felt like it, we could probably spend time and design this one and design this one and see which one comes out to be the cheapest. Yep, that's not too bad. So, but if we look at these, then what we find, actually, if we do that for lots and lots of systems, is we generally find that the direct sequence often requires less energy than the indirect sequence. Okay? And the reason for that is that our light component is actually only vaporized wood. So the, the amount of vapor passing through our reboilers at the bottom of our columns tends to be less if we use the direct sequence. Okay? So that we could think of potentially as our, as our, first, as our first rule. So maybe we always want to head towards this direct sequence because with our three component system, it's actually been found to be often more energy efficient using less energy for the separation. Okay? However, and this is going to be a lot of today's lecture, pretty much many things I'm going to say are going to be followed by however. However, if you've got lots and lots of heavy component, if you've got lots and lots of C, it may end up actually being more energy efficient to use the indirect sequence. Okay? And we'll come and see that in a little bit more detail uh, as we start to look at some of the heuristic rules for this separation. But as I said, it's not too bad when we've got three components because what we can do is do the simulations of both column sequences, it's only four columns after all, and that's how we've seen that this is often true. But what if we start adding more components into our system? So if we've got three components, as we've just seen, the number of possible sequences is two. If we've got four components, the number, number of possible sequences is five. Okay? But this is where it starts to get tricky. If we've got 10 components, if you think about crude oil, something like that, 10 components isn't that many. If you've got 10 components or you, and you want 10 products, there's potentially 4,862 different sequences right, that you can actually use. So who's going to design all of those 4,862 sequences to work out which one is the most energy efficient. Yeah, it's not practical to do that. So we need, some, we need some rules, first of all, to start to guide us to narrow down that potential number of sequences. Okay? So let's concentrate on, for a second, the five components, So because we can do that. So for five components, there's 14 possible sequences. 
So this is all 14 possible sequences for five components drawn out. Okay? <clears throat> so this is a standard notation. <clears throat> and what it means is, is you can see the slash in between some of the letters. The slash essentially is the point where we're actually making the separation. So in this case, this one we've separated A as a pure component and we're left with the bottom product of a mixture of B, C, D, and E. Yep. So these are our 14 possible sequences. But we've still got <coughs> the two sort of key sequences that we spoke about when we only had three components. So we still have this very top sequence here, which can always be referred to as a direct sequence because we're always taking the least volatile component off the top of our distillation column. And we also always have the indirect sequence at the bottom, because we're always taking our least volatile component off at the bottom. Okay? But in this case, we've also got these other 12 sequences in the middle, which are made up of different separations with distillation columns, okay? So, of course, our role as, a <clears throat> as an engineer in this problem is basically to pick which one of those is the best one because we only need to build the best one. We only want to build the best one because that will be the cheapest and that will save us the most money, okay? So we've got to be able to work out how we can pick the best option. So out of all our sequences we get, not every sequence will be feasible. Okay? So there's some, clear, <clears throat> there's some clear things that we need to sort of handle in our distillation sequence first. Okay, and one of these examples is if we've got like a ha if we've got a hazardous component, if we've got a heat sensitive or reactive component, or some corrosive components, we really need to get those out of our sequence of distillation columns first. Yeah, because if you've got a very hazardous component, <clears throat> then if you remove that in your first distillation column your first distillation column is classed as hazardous, but then all your following distillation columns don't need to have that hazardous classification because you've removed the hazardous material. Yeah, so if there was an accident, you'd have a lot less hazardous areas of your plant. Yeah? So if you've got reactive or heat-sensitive components, so with a reactive or heat-sensitive component, every time that component passes through a reboiler, you lose some of that component. Yeah, it degrades, it reacts, it breaks down, it might form fouling in the system. So if you take this out as early as you can, it goes through a lot less reboilers. So you don't lose as much, not as much breaks down. And corrosive components, if you've got corrosive components, you need to make sure you design your pipe work your distillation columns to be able to handle those corrosive components. And that's more expensive. So if you remove the corrosive components as early as possible, it means all the following distillation columns don't need to be made of such expensive material because they don't need to come into contact with the corrosive component. Okay? So there's some sort of some key practical ones that will start to narrow down your, your sequences straight away. The next one is that along with these components that might break down in the reboilers, because you can have this, if you can really manage it, you want to try and avoid getting your final product from a reboiler. Because if there is going to be any corrosion, fouling or breaking down, it tends to be in a reboiler where it's hottest. That means that you're more likely to get some of that contaminant in your product. 
So if it's possible, you would always like to take your product off as a top product off your distillation column. Okay? I think we recognize that's not always possible, but if we can, we want to try and do that. Okay? If we've got components in our system that might polymerize, so again, sort of reactive components, but ones that might polymerize, we tend to have to add chemicals that inhibit that polymerization. And these tend to be very high boiling point components, so very involatile. So these tend to always end up in the bottom product, which again links to why we want the final product to be taken overhead, because our bottom product will always end up having potentially some of these specialist inhibitor chemicals in. Okay? <clears throat> And also, you may end up with some components that are very difficult to condense. Okay, so I mentioned when we were talking about systems that uh, have lots of components, and I said crude oil. So if you've got oil, crude oil, you may, in that mixture, have uh, lots of long carbon chains, C8, C9, C10, 20, 40, but you may also have some methane, some ethane, some butane, okay? These are all sort of gaseous components at room temperature, and things like methane and ethane have very low boiling points and tend to operate, and tend to be very difficult to condense. And a lot of the distillation columns that we've always been thinking about have total condensers, so that would mean that we'd need to look at things like refrigeration or very high operating pressures, which are very expensive. So often, in our first column, at the top of our first column, we have a partial condenser where our heavier components are condensed and fed back, but our sort of non-condensable components are then vented as a gas off the top of our first column. So if we've got non-condensable components in our mixture, we would really want to try and remove them in the first distillation column because then it removes the need for refrigeration to actually condense them to use them in the recycle. Okay? So that's sort of three key things where when we're looking at the sequences, we must consider first. So we must have, if there's any special components, corrosive, reactive, try and get them out as soon as possible. We really want to try and get products from the top of our distillation column. And if we've got like non-condensable or things with very low boiling points, we want to try and get them out first because that reduces our need for refrigeration. Okay? But after that we really then have a free choice, okay? So after we've moved our problem components, we could still have six, seven, eight, nine, ten components in our mixture. And then essentially we have a free choice about the sequence, okay? So we still need to work out how to narrow that down to get maybe one or two sequences we can fully design to look at which one is really cheapest, okay? So what's been developed is these heuristic rules, okay? And these have basically come from practice, so people that have been designing distillation column sequences, uh, and they've been looking at ones that are the cheapest to operate, they've come with these rules to try and help us, so that we can use these rules and guidelines to try and pick the best few sequences to design, okay? And for simple distillation columns, it's these four, okay? So I think that the first one is quite self-explanatory and is actually echoed in, if you remember all the way back to the first lecture, when I was talking about separations in general, and I said it's always better to try and do the most difficult separation last, 
because the most difficult separation is the hardest one, the most expensive separation to do. It may need the most, uh, might need the most recycle, might have the most number of columns in, so it's already very expensive. If you do it last, last is where you've removed everything else. So your flow rate will be the lowest possible, which allows you to make the equipment as small as possible, reducing the cost. Yep. If you try and do that very difficult separation at the start, where you've also got lots of other components, you're having to make that very difficult separation, the equipment for that separation, much bigger, just because you've got these extra components in there with them. Okay? So doing the most difficult separation last <coughs> really can help reduce the costs. Okay? The second heuristic rule is the one that already came up when we were talking about those two, just having the two distillation columns, which is that the direct sequence generally is more energy efficient. Okay? And the reason for that, as I mentioned, is that our lightest component doesn't get reboiled as much because it can go straight up the first column and straight out the top. So we're not having to put so much energy in to reboil that first component. Okay? What we can do is for that three component system is actually we can just have a quick look at that. So, so if we make a simple assumption of a, of a good chart cut, then if we use the Underwood equation, we can actually determine the minimum reflux ratio. Yep. So if we look at our vapor flow rate in our reboilers and calculate that for our direct sequence over here and our indirect sequence down here, okay, and we calculate that total vapor flow rate that we need to generate, this area of our ternary diagram is where the vapor flow rate for the direct sequence is lower than the vapor flow rate needed for the indirect sequence. Okay? So you can see that nearly every composition, the direct sequence turns out to need to generate less vapor, so it's likely to be much cheaper. Yep. The only bit of our diagram that doesn't agree with this is that one exception I already mentioned is where you have loads of component C. So this corner down here, so this triangle in this bottom corner has 80% component C in the feed. Yep. So it's only when you've got a very large amount of component C that the indirect sequence actually produces less vapor load. Okay? So the third one of these, again, I think is relatively self-explanatory. Remove large fraction components first. Yep. So this comes down to your size of equipment. If you can remove as much of your flow rate as possible, then all the remaining distillation columns can be smaller because you, you're putting less material through them. So if you can remove the large fraction components first, you're removing more material from, from your sequence. Okay? So your columns can be smaller and thus cheaper. And then the final one is separate each feed 50-50. Okay? So that basically means we want the flow rate of our distillate product and the flow rate of our bottom product to be as similar as possible. Obviously, by 50-50, it's not exactly, it's, you know, you're not going to exactly get it equal flow rates, but you want to try and get the flow rates as similar as possible. Okay? 
And the reason for that is because it allows you to balance, it balances the heat duty across the column and thus makes the, the equilibriums on the trays and the, the, the amount of heating you need and the vapor load to be more efficient because you're not, say, trying to heat up a whole column with a very small amount of flow. Okay? So that balance helps the heat load in the column and tends to make the column a lot more energy efficient and need a lot less vapor load. Okay? So that's really our four key heuristic rules. Okay? So, so what we do when we're faced with our, our components we need to separate is first of all we look at our special components as previously mentioned and remove ones that we need to move first and then with our remaining components we look at the flow rates and the relative volatilities and try and assess them against these heuristic rules to find out which are the best sequences. Okay? So the difficulty can come in when the heuristics start to conflict with each other. Yes? So for example, your largest component, your largest composition component may also be the most difficult one to separate. Yep. So you've got a conflict between the two heuristic rules. Yep. But if you remember, what we're really trying to do with the heuristics is not, is not, pick, the one, it's not pick the one final. It's to narrow down from the potential thousands of options down to the best couple because the best couple we can actually calculate in full detail. Yeah, we can actually look at some of the performance indicators on just the final couple to assess which one is really the best one. But we don't want to do those calculations for thousands of sequences. We just want to do it for two or three. Okay? So we've always got those performance indicators. So, so what do I mean by these performance indicators? Okay? So I've already, I've already sneakily used one of the performance indicators already to demonstrate to you about the direct sequence being the best sequence. And that was where I was talking about the vapor load. Yep. So if we calculate the vapor load that's generated by our reboilers, because that vapor load is essentially related to how much heating we need to put in the system because we're generating that vapor in the reboiler, <clears throat> then that tends to give a very good indication of how efficient the separation is, how much energy it's going to cost us. The advantage of the vapor load is that it's very quick to calculate because you need the reflux ratio, you need your bottom product flow rate, your top product flow rate, and the feed, and from that you can calculate how much vapor must be generated in the reboiler. Okay? So it's a very quick to calculate. Yep. The disadvantage of it is that it's not, it's not the full story. Yeah, because we've not thought about the condensers, we've not thought about any other duties in our column. But if we're trying to narrow it down really quick, the vapor load is good. Okay. So the next option is total energy demand. Yeah. So in this case, we're going one step further than our vapor load. And we're saying, well, what we need to do is we need to create the vapor. So we need heat utility. And we're also remembering that we've got our condensers at the top. So we also need cooling utility and we calculate that total energy demand for our system. Okay? So that's a bit more accurate than our total vapor load because it's taking into account the condensers as well. Okay? But it's, it's more calculations to do. 
Our third one is our operating cost. Okay, so now we're bringing in a further complexity and we're saying, well, yes, we've got to heat it and cool it, but what are we heating it and cooling it with? Yep, so, so as was um, mentioned last week when we were talking about heating and cooling, when we're thinking about our distillation columns, what, what, what utility are you using? Are you using really expensive steam to heat it, or can you get away with cheap steam? Yep. Are you using refrigerant, or can you get away with just cooling water? Yep, because they can be factored into our sequences, because the different sequences we generate will have different top and bottom products, thus the condensers and reboilers will be at different temperatures depending on the sequence, so our utility need might be different. But we can calculate that total operating cost and it's, again, slightly more accurate than the total energy demand. So that's an advantage, but it's a more complex calculation. So that's a disadvantage. Yep. So we tend, to, we tend to build through these steps and rule out. So we might rule some out on vapor load, but we're still not sure between two. So we may have to move to a more complicated one. Of course, as well as operating costs, we've got capital costs. So we also were thinking about now the difficulty of the separation in terms of the number of trays, which really we combine together, of course, in our, in our one that's the, the truest representation of which one is the better one, which is, of course, is the totalized annual cost, which covers the energy, the utility use, the cost of the column, energy trade-offs, potentially process and heat integration within the rest of our plant. Yep. So this is obviously the one we do right at the end when we've got our whole plant together. But to narrow down to that final sequence, we can look at some of these sort of much more easy to calculate performance indicators. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep, so it's like a process. We use our heuristics, then that narrows it down, then we start to look at the performance indicators, that narrows it down, then we get our final, what we think will be the best design, and that's the one we can use and do all of the final optimization and design on. Okay. These new sort of complex distillation columns, they're sometimes also called thermally coupled distillation columns. <clears throat> and these are different to our simple distillation columns because in our complex or thermally coupled distillation columns, what we can have is we can have columns being linked by two directional flows, meaning that columns can have either no condenser or no reboiler, or, or neither. Okay? Also, we can have columns in our complex distillation columns, also includes columns that have more than two products. So we could have three products coming out of our distillation column. Okay? So, so let's stick with our, our thought to start with, where we've got our three components, and we've got our indirect sequence we're using for our three components. So if we stick with our simple distillation column configuration, then we've got our A, B, and C, and we've got our C separated from our first column, and then our top product goes, and we've got our A and B separated from our, bottom, uh, our second column. Okay? So if we think about this column structure, what we've got is we've got this condenser here that is condensing some of our vapor, well, it's condensing all of our vapor, and putting some liquid back into the first column, 
and also some of that liquid is going into our second column. Okay? So we've got a vapour coming out the first column. We're essentially using utility to condense that, putting some back in to our first column and some to our second column. So what if we think about, well, all we need to supply to the first column is some vapour and liquid, okay? But also what goes, to, and we need a feed into our second column. So what we can actually think about is removing that condenser and having our vapour that comes out of our first column be a vapour feed into our second column and then taking some of the liquid out of our second column and putting it back into our first column. Okay? So our first column is still it still has vapour leaving it and has liquid entering it and then the change is that we've coupled that now to our second column. Okay? So what we've done is we've removed a condenser. So what we've done is we've, we've then saved all of the duty or some of the duty that, that can, we were having to use for that condenser. We've just removed that from our column configuration. And then what we can do is because it's just a configurational part now of our column is that this is a liquid flow coming out and a vapour flow coming this way and a liquid flow next to a vapour flow is exactly the same thing as we have in one of our trays on our distillation column. So what we can do is we can actually just take this section 3 here and move the location of that on top of our first column. So we can just actually transform this setup here into this configuration, okay? which is exactly the same it's just that we end up building it differently. Okay? And the reason that we do that is because if we think about process control, then if we're controlling on this condenser, we've got a long way from this second column into this first column for our process control to take. So if we move that onto our first column and control it, we then get better control over our first column. Okay? But really the benefit to us is that we've gone from our indirect sequence and we're separating our three components and we've moved to this what's called a side stripper arrangement, but we've lost one of our condensers. So our duty is much likely to be lower. Okay? And of course, the reason it's called a side stripper arrangement is because this extra part here is just the stripping section of, of our column, the bottom part. Okay? So if we can do this from our indirect sequence, there's absolutely nothing stopping us doing the same kind of process but to our direct sequence. However, in this case, it's, our, it's a reboiler which performs a link between the two columns. So we perform exactly the same set of steps. We essentially remove this reboiler and then we have a liquid coming out the bottom of our column and supplying our second column and a vapour which we send back to our first column. Okay? And then, just like we did with the size stripper arrangement, we can do that movement to help us with control. So in this case, this section four, we can physically move onto the bottom of our first column. So we get something that looks like this. Okay? And this is called a side rectify because we've got our spare rectifying section on our system. Okay? So again, we've made another saving because in this case we've removed one of our reboilers. Okay? So this now gives us two more potential options 
we can consider when we're looking at our distillation sequencing. Okay? So we can also just more simply think, well, <clears throat> if we've got three products and we potentially <clears throat> just need to remove some from the side of our column, as we move down our column, the composition in our column changes. And potentially, there's a point in our column where we can just put a side stream on and take out our middle component, okay? So we can also bring in these two new designs as well of these side stream columns, okay? And the difference here is that if we go below our feed, we will take a vapor side stream out, okay? And the reason for that is if we think about being below our feed, then C is our least volatile component and B is our most volatile component in this bottom part of the column. So if we think of the equilibrium between the liquid on a tray and the vapor on a tray, the vapor on a particular tray will have a higher composition of B in it compared to the liquid on the tray. Yep. So by taking a vapor side stream, we then get that side stream to be higher in composition of B. Yep. And for taking a side stream above the feed, we make exactly the same argument. So we've got a balance between the vapor and liquid on each tray. But because B is now compared to A, so B now is our le least volatile component, that means that the liquid composition on the tray will have the most B fraction in, so therefore we should take it as a liquid side stream. Okay? So does that make sense? Yep, so, yep. Um, okay, yeah, so, so with the vapor, with the vapor side stream, uh, so, essentially, if you have your pipe opening would have to be above the liquid level on the tray because then it's in the vapor section. And then, in reality, what you need then is some kind of system that doesn't allow any liquid droplets to just be carried over into that stream. So, that's, that's um, like a mechanical design of a distillation column. So, you might have, a, you might have like a little weir that comes down to block direct entry of spray or liquid into that side stream. Yep. And then the liquid one is a bit easier because if a liquid one is essentially below your liquid level, then you just get the liquid coming off. Yep. Yeah, so um, I'm going to just, if it's okay, I'll park that question. <laughs> because uh, that comes into the bit. So first of all, I sort of introduced in the concept, and then, then we'll come to, and where are they useful, which is exactly that question. What, what do we need to make these useful designs? Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so we've now got these four potential extra options we can use. And then there's one more we can think about as well, okay? So we also can have what's called a prefractionator arrangement. And sometimes, if we've got our system of three components, we have a distillation column at the front that perhaps makes a poor separation. So we end up with a top product that has A and quite a lot of B in it, and we end up with a bottom product that has C and also quite a lot of B in it. So in itself, they're no use. But then we have a second distillation column that will then separate A from the top and C from the bottom. And then we can have 
a side stream in the middle where our concentration of B is, is very high. Okay? And we can make these more energy efficient in a very similar way to the side stripper and side rectifier arrangement. But in this case, we've got a condenser going from one column to another and a reboiler going from one column to another. So we can actually remove both. So we've got essentially the same system as we had for the side strippers and side rectifiers to get this thermally coupled prefractionator column. Okay? But actually... Mechanically, when we build it, we can even go one step further where often we move into what's called a dividing wall column. And we actually put this column inside this column. Okay? So we get something that looks like this. So we have our A, B, and C going in. And we get partial separation on this side of our wall. And then we have a different separation on the other side of our wall in the column. And the advantage of something like this is not only does it reduce the operating costs because we've saved no condenser, sorry, no condenser and no reboiler, but now, because we've actually put this in here, we now only have one column instead of two columns. Yep, so we've also saved on capital cost as well. Okay? So let's now sort of have a, <clears throat> have a think about why some of these might be useful. So, so I've mentioned with the side strip and the side rectifier that we're, we're clearly removing a um, reboiler and a condenser. So... That, that's bound to save us some energy. With a side stream, obviously, we're, we're actually removing a whole distillation column because we're getting three products out just of one column. So that's bound to be a saving. But uh, this prefractionator idea is still a bit tricky, I think. So let's think about just a conventional direct sequence and what's happening to our middle component as we do that. So we've got our first column here, a red column. So in the first column, we're making our separation of A and then BC to come out the bottom. So if we think about B, so we've got our mole fraction of B here in our first column. So there it is going into our feed position. And as we move up to the top of our column, we're reducing the amount of B on each tray, because we're getting more and more pure A. Yep. And then as we go down our column, we're increasing our composition of B, because we're removing A, because that wants to go up the column. But then, we come to this point here, where the mole fraction of B starts to reduce slightly, because we're getting more and more C in our bottom component as well. But what we've got is, as we come out of our first column at the bottom of this red, we've essentially got an, an enhanced concentration of B compared to our feed of B. Okay? So then what we do is we take that composition and we feed that into our second column, so now our blue column, and we're separating B from C. So at the top, as we move up to the top of our blue column, obviously our composition of B is increasing a lot because we're separating it from C. And as we go down our second column, the composition of B is decreasing because we're basically getting more and more pure C. Okay? So that's our conventional, that's conventionally what's happening in our direct sequence. Yep? Does that make sense? Yep, good. Now, the key thing that we have here that I mentioned in our first column is that we're getting this increased concentration of B, but then 
it starts to reduce because now we're getting, now we're purifying our sea more and more. So we actually get this area here where essentially we're increasing the concentration and then decreasing our concentration. So we get this area here where we're essentially paying and putting energy in to make our B more concentrated, and then we're paying and putting energy in to make our B less concentrated again, right? Which doesn't make much sense. Our optimum point to remove B would be at this peak of B here, right? But we obviously can't do that because then we'd have a very impure mixture of B and C in our, coming off that, that stream. So this is where our prefractionator comes in. So now, if we think about our prefractionator, we've got, exact, we've got our, our similar feed coming in of A, B, and C, and it's coming in to our red column. So here's our red column here. We've got our feed coming in. As we move up our column, we're doing a little bit of enhancement of the B because we're removing some of the C. And as we come down this column, we're doing a little bit of the enhancement of B. But actually, the concentration of B is staying re relatively constant in that first column. Because in that first column, what we're really doing is separating A from C. Yep. Because the concentration coming out here of A is very high and of C is very low. And in this stream here, the concentration of C is very high and A is very low. And we're just letting B do whatever B wants to do in that first column. We're not worried about B too much because we know all of the B is going into our second column. So we've got two feeds into our second column. One that's very rich in A with some B and one that's very rich in C with some B. And our second column is now at the top, is separating our A from B. So as we move towards the very top, we decrease the concentration of B and increase A. And then we're decreasing B as we move down. And the bottom of the column is separating B from C. And then midpoint for our column, we basically have a very high concentration of B. And we, so we can simply have a side stream to take that very high concentration of B away, okay? But what we've crucially, what we've critically not done in that situation is we've not separated and enhanced the concentration of B just to remix it back into a lower concentration. And that's where we end up saving the energy with, with an arrangement like this prefractionator arrangement. Okay? And in fact, that, that remixing process in, in a lot of situations can be so much that actually if we try and remove that, mix, that remixing process by either using a prefractionator or a side stream or a stripping or rectifying side column, we can actually save 30% in energy over a conventional simple column equivalent, right? So that's a lot of energy just from essentially picking a solution that doesn't have that remixing of our intermediate component in, okay? So there is something else that we need to think about when we use these columns. So if we've got here, so we've got our sort of standard direct sequence here. And then if you remember, one of the things I mentioned was when we were talking about um, looking at and identifying whether these were optimal sequences, the very bottom, the very bottom option was looking at a total annualized cost with potential process integration options. Okay? 
Now, when we've got the process integration options, what we're doing is we're making use of the, the utility streams, the utility energy we have from our condensers and our reboilers. So if we look at our standard uh, direct sequence here, so we've got our first column, and we'll have a reboiler at the temperature of our mixture of B and C, and we have a condenser at the temperature of our pure A, basically. So we have our reboiler at this temperature and our condenser at this temperature, and then basically this amount of enthalpy needed to do the separation in the first column. And then in our second column, we'll have our reboiler at a slightly higher temperature because we're now that stream now is basically almost pure C, and we'll have a condenser at a higher temperature because that's now basically pure B. Yep. But we may be, pro we may be integrating these reboilers at the different temperatures. Okay. But as we move this into our, our side column arrangement, what happens is, is because the compositions change and the heat duties change, so our condensers basically say the same, okay? Because we've still got pure A and pure B there. But now, we've only got one reboiler, and that reboiler is basically at our pure C part, which is up here. So although we're saving a total in heat or a total in enthalpy needed, so we're reducing the length of this, which saves us the money. What, what it means is, is all of our heating is now at this higher reboiler temperature, so we don't have this lower temperature utility need anymore. Okay? So just because we move from this to this to save us energy, we do need to think about how that's going to work if we're happening to do process integration as well. Or it could be a case where this temperature here, we can use low pressure cheap steam, but this temperature here, we now need to use expensive high pressure steam. So we're, we may be reducing the amount of energy we put in, but we may actually be increasing the amount of expensive high pressure steam we need as a utility. So there's always a balance and a payoff in these systems. Okay, so, so as I mentioned, these thermal coupled arrangements or complex columns are able to reduce energy, and it can be 30%, up to 30%, and in some cases you can get more, but often 30% of the energy of the equivalent simple distillation column sequence, we can save by moving to one of these coupled columns. Okay? But what we need to do is then think, well, how do we include these columns into our heuristics? And that was the question that came that I dodged earlier. When are these columns actually going to work, basically? and we've got some heuristic rules for these particular columns. So it's found that for side stream columns, because we've got this balance here between the B and the C, so we've got a vapor side stream column for B, the areas where these tend to save energy is when we've got a very large fraction of B Yep, so when B is over 50% of our feed, and in this case C is a very small percent, so less than 5% of our feed, and the relative volatility between B and C is much larger than that between A and B, so it's much easier to separate B from C than it is to separate A from B, it's found that these, the vapor side stream option, tend to save energy compared to the conventional columns, okay?
For our liquid side stream, it's very similar. So again, a large quantity of B, over 50% of B in our feed. But in this case, for a liquid side stream, because it's now at the top of our column, we need a very small fraction of A, less than 5% in our feed. And it now needs to be much more easy to separate A from B as it is to separate B from C. Okay? So you can see for the two side stream versions are very similar. But if we've got lots of B, small amount of A, we look towards a liquid side stream. And if we've got lots of B, small amount of C, we think about looking at a vapor side stream. Okay. For the coupled columns, so for a side stripper, if we've got now a lot less B, so less than 30% of B in the feed, and there's a lot more C than A, then it turns out that this side stripper arrangement starts to look more economically viable to save energy. Okay? So what I'm going to do is let, if we, we can think about this side stripper arrangement the same way that we thought about this indirect versus um, direct uh, so in sequencing before. So if this is our ternary system, okay, so exactly the same as we had before, we've got our B, C, and A, and you can see we've got this black line up here. So that's like we had before, and anything on this side of the black line is better as a direct sequence, and anything on this line is better as an indirect sequence. Yep. So then what we can do is we can do exactly the same vapor load calculations, but for our side stripper. Okay? So we can do exactly the same calculations, but for our side stripper. And what we basically get, so the colour on here, is the percent saving or the percent reduction in vapour load by using a side stripper. Okay? So, if we look at this graph, where, where is it better to use a side stripper? Right? So, the redder it is, the better it is using a side stripper, right? Because that's giving us the greatest saving. So if we're down here, this is where we want to investigate the potential of using a side stripper. If we're up here, it's not really making any saving over just using the conventional simple column sequence. Yep. So what was our heuristic? So our heuristic was if it's less than 30% B, think about a side stripper. So, less than 30% B, think about a side stripper. And what was the other one? It was if there's more C than A, think about a side stripper. So, if there's more C than A, think about a side stripper. Yep. So, we're basically saying... If you're in this area here that's not shaded out, that's probably where we want to investigate the potential of using a side stripper. Yep. And that's been picked because that is what corresponds to this energy saving area. So instead of having to do this calculation for everything, we can use the heuristics, and then if our sequence falls into here, it then can give us the option of whether we potentially investigate that side stripper. So we can do the same with a side rectifier. And of course, as you're, you'd be unsurprised to find that basically the side stripper has the same as the, sorry, the side rectifier has the same as the side stripper, that we still have less than 30% of B in the feed. But in this case, our composition of A needs to be more than the composition of C. Okay? And then our final option is our prefractionator arrangement. And for the, and for the area heuristic-wise for this, where it's essentially sensible, 
is if B is a large fraction of our field, and because we want an even flow out of this the start of the column out, out of our pre-fractionated column, we want the relative volatility of A to B to be very similar to the relative volatility of B to C. And that basically means that B is evenly, is evenly split in this first column. Okay? So what we've got there is we've now got, so we've got our sequences we can use with our simple columns and our four heuristics for those. But we've also as well now in our sort of toolbox, we've got these five complex columns which we can also think about. And if, and we've got the heuristics of when we can implement those five different designs that could potentially save us extra energy over using the equivalent simple distillation solution. Okay? So hopefully today you've got sort of a, a grasp of how we want to think about these columns and how we can separate them. And we've got, we've got those key rules, so we've got the rules we must follow, and then we've got the heuristics that then we use after we've reduced what we can. We then have, can we include some of our complex distillation columns as well? And that will narrow down from potentially thousands of options, that will narrow down to just a couple of options. And then those couple of options, we can use our performance indicators to narrow down further, to maybe a final option or maybe two final options and it's at that point that we would do like the full design of those sequences and optimization to find our very best sequence with our very best operating conditions for that sequence. Okay?